Um, our agenda is we're just wrapping up introductions. Then Megan's doing a presentation about taking control of the permitting process. And we're going to do the Q&A. So just want to give an amazing welcome to Megan, uh, staff attorney and outreach director at Fair Shake and her own firm, Hunter and Hunter LLC. Um, hey, Josh, do you want to talk a little bit about Fair Shake and, and how you know, your work with Megan like brought up this presentation? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, not sure if I'm, if I'm on or not, but um, yeah, we can hear yeah. You. All right, cool. So uh, yeah, so you know, this kind of started with you and I actually, Ryan, just talking about what, you know, how can we get information that people need uh, out to them through these webinar processes. And we started with asking a question to your your audience and your network, like what do you want to hear from, from someone like us? And so this is uh, the second part of that, um, that series that we call um, the decision-making series. And the goal is to try to help people make more informed decisions, um, to help them, like, clue them in on when like, to participate in the process. Um, but we also understand that this is uh, very, very detailed work and every single circumstance is going to be different. So, um, so we just want to encourage everybody to ask specific questions. Uh, we're going to dedicate time at the end for that and for your questions and think of uh, the presentation as a great overview of, of what you might need to know, but with the understanding that this is going to be different for every circumstance and, and we're here to try to help with that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. It's been it's been cool to to partner with with you all and um and Megan, it's great to meet you today. We just met before the webinar getting ready and I just feel really grateful that you're sharing all the experience that you have with us and are being available to answer our questions as well. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'm very excited to to be here and to be participating in this. Great. So um, if you just jumped in, you'll see a Q&A area in your Zoom controls um, here on the webinar. That's where you can add questions, and, um, and then I'll be helping to field those questions after the presentation. So, um, ready to get started? I'm going to stop my share, and we'll do our, our handoff now. Okay. All right. Well, let's let's get started then. Um, so, as Ryan already gave me a wonderful uh, introduction, I am an attorney with Fair Shake Environmental Legal Services, and we are a nonprofit environmental law firm uh, seeking to provide access to environmental justice. And we work primarily in the Appalachian Basin of Ohio and Pennsylvania. And we provide legal services on income-based rates. So we use a sliding scale to try to make uh, good representation on environmental matters accessible uh, to people of all means. And we also strive to go beyond the courtroom. So we're not only attorneys representing folks in specific litigation matters and specific legal matters, uh, but we really seek to walk with our clients, provide counsel along the way. And some of that is in the form of our, our outreach program, uh, which involves projects like this, um, community presentations like this, and, and fielding calls and working with communities to make sure that they are informed of, of their environmental rights and helping them to exercise them. So just a quick uh, legal disclaimer. So I am an attorney, so I have to do this. Um, and I, I'm licensed in Ohio and New York, but regardless, this presentation is just for general information purposes. Um, and that's because if you're going to get legal advice, you really need specific legal advice. And that's not what I'm giving here today. Um, it, it's not designed to be tailored specifically to you. This is a general informational presentation. Um, we certainly encourage you to seek legal counsel if you're looking for specific, specific advice on anything. So today's 
presentation is is on the permit process generally. Um, and so when, when I say that, um, we're going to be talking a little bit about state permits as well as federal permits, mainly environmental permits, so permits that are issued under some of the main environmental laws uh, th that we have either at the state or the federal level. Um, obviously, I work primarily in Ohio, um, and Fair Shake works primarily in Ohio and Pennsylvania, so most of our experience is from those states, uh, but I'm, I'm going to be talking at thing, about things at a high level uh, to hopefully uh, you know, co cover various structures that are applicable um, in, in multiple environments. Um, and we'll be discussing what information you need to effectively participate in the permitting process, why you should want to participate in the permitting process, and we'll get the conversation started about how you can effectively participate in that process. So I think permitting can you know, be kind of a strange topic, uh, depending on who you're talking to. So I wanted to, to start by asking this question of, well, why, why should we care about the permitting process if a given community's goal or a given organization's goal is really just to stop a facility to, from coming in or to shut a facility down? They really just don't want the facility coming in. Um, why bother? Why bother with air permits? Why bother with water per permits? Why, why do you care about what's in the permit at all? Um, and I think that the answer to that question is, is many fold. Um, one of which is, is just the, the cold hard truth. Most of the time, you're not going to stop the facility. Most of the time, you're not going to get the facility shut down. That's not to say it doesn't happen. It absolutely does happen. People do stop facilities and do get them shut down. Um, but if you do end up stopping it, um, it will be through the permitting process. And I don't mean necessarily that you're going to get a permit thrown out that's going to result in a, in a facility not being able to be constructed or um, not moving forward. Uh, but the, by participating in the permitting process, you develop relationships with, with the public agencies that are governing these facilities. You also collect the information that is going to be critical to organizing efforts uh, and to educating your community about the concerns that you have with a given facility. So regardless um, of if your goal is just to stop, is to stop a facility or to end up with a strong enforceable permit, the information that you gather by participating in the public participation process is extremely important to, to both of those efforts. So I'm, I, I think I'm getting questions here and maybe I'll take more of those at the end simply because it's difficult for me to navigate how to, how to bring them down unless Ryan wants to pop in and help. Yeah, Megan, I think we'll, we'll do them all at the end. Okay, okay, great. So again, this question of what am I talking about when I talk about permits? That really depends on the type of facility at issue. Um, so for all the our major environmental statutes, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, um, you're you're typically dealing with both state and federal permits, um, de depending on which state you're in, who is delegated delegated authority to do what. Um, and obviously the type of facility depends on what permits are most relevant to you. Um, but environmental permits are basically how we carry out most of our environmental laws. They're not all of it, but they're a huge part of how our government carries out our environmental laws and enforces our environmental laws. Um, so you will see permits for air governing air emissions, governing uh, impacts to surface water, governing underground injection, um, and, a, and a whole host of things. Uh, and so I, I want to give you know a broad overview of, of some of those. So, so for example, if you're thinking about um, air, you're, you, there are all sorts of permits that might be at issue in terms of a permit to install a, a major source, um, like a large gas processing plant or a fractionation plant um, or an ethane cracker plant. Uh, but that's just to construct the facility. You can, later down the line, you'll have an operating permit that governs how that facility is, is able to operate. Uh, 
Um, for surface water, you have discharge permits direct where a facility is getting permission to discharge uh, into a body of water, but you also have um, what's called a 401 certification where the state has to certify uh, that the facility is going to be in compliance with the state's uh, water quality standards and water quality laws. Um, if there is going to be dredge or fill happening, uh, you have a 404 permit that's done by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So, yeah, if you're dealing with, let's say, uh, you know, in Ohio, we have a lot of um, underground injection uh, of oil and gas waste. Um, so that's through the underground injection control program. Um, and that has a permit to inject um, that, that has to, to take place. Likewise with um, some of the new storage of ethane that we're seeing in salt caverns uh, under, under the ground, that also is an underground injection permit that people have to get. Um, so really, it, you know, it, it depends on the, the facility what, what type of permit we're talking about. Um, I also have a graphic over here um, speaking about FERC's permitting process uh, and, and what can, can come, it come into play uh, just to demonstrate with pipelines uh, how many different uh, environmental laws you might be looking at. And I think all of those need to be looked at um, from the perspective of opportunities for the public to raise their concerns uh, and to get involved in the permitting process. Um, this just, yeah, I'm going to skip through this, but it, it just um, gives you an example of some of the, in, the public input opportunities uh, throughout the FERC process. Um, and in all of these cases, not all, but in many of these cases, uh, you do need to get involved fairly early. So with the FERC process, for example, um, if you're wanting to intervene in a FERC permitting process, that has to happen very early on in the, in the permitting process. Um, and we'll talk about this more later, but for all of these permits, there is typically a public notice opportunity. That public notice opportunity is not always easy to find. Um, so even though the law requires, for instance, that a, an application be publicly noticed for, so people can comment on it, um, that, that notice might run in the back of a paper two counties over from where you live. Um, and so it's extremely important that you or someone in your group has an idea of where public notices are traditionally uh, placed and in what newspaper form are they available online uh, in your particular instance uh, and making sure that you either you yourself are following them or uh, someone in your team is because it's so easy to miss the, these opportunities. And this is, this is just a graphic demonstrating um, the timeline of how some, and again, this, this is speaking to the FERC process mostly, uh, but you get the sense in, in what happened with the line three resistance um, of how you can have a state permitting process that begins back in November, 2013. And then it's November 14 when we see um, action beginning, uh, you know, for the, for the line three pipeline. And then it, just gives you a sense of um, while it can be a lengthy process uh, for, for a project to get fully permitted, all along the way, uh, there are opportunities to be involved, but the sooner you can be involved, the better. Um, and so I think this, this is also extremely important to highlight when we think about how the government of our environment happens, how it works. Essentially, you have state agencies, you have federal agencies whose job is to carry out our environmental laws, to enforce those laws, to make sure they're being complied with. And then you have permittees, you have polluters, you have applicants, choose whatever name you want for them. You have a, a group of, of people who want to do something. They want to build something. They want to expand something. Um, those people 
are interacting regularly with our regulators. They are sitting down with the regulators and figuring out exactly how to walk through the permitting process. They are raising their concerns about the permitting process. Uh, and that dialogue starts before the public even knows that a project's going to come in. So I think it's extremely important that we start to see our own communities in that same light of how can I take control of, of my community and make sure that my concerns are proactively getting before regulators' eyes? And so once you're in the, per I, th I just think because of how it's set up, the permitting process happens to be your opportunity to do a lot of that. But, um, and I'm, I'm just gonna skip over some of these just for sa if, sake of time. Um, so your, your permitting process is the way that you do that. But if you have not done the background work uh, before the permit is issued, if you don't have an understanding of what's going on in your community um, before the permit is issued, it's very, very hard to play catch up because the applicant has been working all along. It has been collecting data on your community all along. It's been creating an argument for why it should be able to discharge to the air or discharge to the water. Um, and it's been working with the regulators to do that. So the question is, how can we start to do that same task? Um, and so just looking at um, the example of surface water discharge permits. Um, so here you have several types of permits that, that could occur and be relevant for, let's say, I'm just going to use the example of, a, of an ethane cracker plant, um, just because there is a lot of pet chem development proposed for, for our particular area. Um, so if they are wanting to get a permit to discharge uh, their wastewater to, um, to the Ohio River or to any surface water, what they need is called a, a NIPTES permit, um, a National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit under the Clean Water Act. And traditionally, that, the goal of that program was really to eliminate all discharges to our, of pollutants to our surface waters. It was a very ambitious goal. Um, and instead, what we have now, it's been weakened a bit. Instead, what we have now is no point source uh, can discharge to any water of the U.S., can discharge any pollutant to any water of the U.S. without a permit to do so. And then that permit dictates the terms under which they are able to discharge pollutants to our surface waters. So in the process of issuing that, um, there are certain things that they, they just can't, can't do. So on this slide, um, you'll see anti-degradation review mentioned. Um, so we can't, uh, any permittee, any polluter, any applicant uh, cannot eliminate an existing use of a water body. Um, that is prohibited. Likewise, if someone wants to fill or dredge, um, we, this anti-degradation analysis has to take place where existing uses of the water body have to be maintain, maintained and where in general the water quality cannot be lowered through the permit um, except if there are uh, certain beneficial, if it's justified by certain beneficial social and economic uh, benefits. Uh, but there, even there, they do have to conduct an alternatives analysis that shows that they've looked at other things. Um, so if we're just thinking about the, the NIPTES permitting scheme, you know um, that existing uses must be maintained, for example. Well, do you know the existing uses of your water bodies, the, the water bodies that are in your community, that are precious to you, that are, are sacred to you, um, that you enjoy? Do you know that? Um, do you know who fishes there? Do you know what kind of fish they catch? Do you know what kind of bugs somebody enjoys observing every day? Um, these are things that actually can really matter, what the existing uses are of a, of a stream. And oftentimes, uh, that data doesn't make it in the record uh, in terms of how a particular water, water body is actually used. Um, as well as actual samples that actually show um, numerically 
what the water quality is uh, in a given water body. And these are things that we need to know. We need to know these things about our communities so that when a polluter comes in, we are armed with the data to fully participate in the, the permitting process uh, and defend the things that we love. Because otherwise, we're having to hire an expert, we're having to, to catch up um, and try to understand a place that we love but don't quantitatively know. And so these, these are some, some of the questions uh, that, that you could ask yourself um, when you're thinking about how to protect your surface waters, about what do you actually know um, about your surface water, what surveys have been done, um, and what parameters have been monitored. And also, is it, do you have an expert that needs to be helping you now? Um, Experts can be extremely expensive, so it can be very helpful to, to start working with one um, and, and make sure you have that expert support as well. Um, and I'll just provide a couple other examples of, of different permitting and the types of information that you would want to think about um, as you prepare to be able to effectively contribute in the permitting process. Um, so our underground injection control program is under the Safe Drinking Water Act and it's designed to protect our, our groundwater. Um, and it basically prohibits any underground injection without a permit. Some of those permits might be made via rule as opposed to a, an individual permit. Um, it depends on the type of well at issue, the type of underground injection at issue. Um, and it prohibits any underground injection that would endanger drinking water. So that gets really interesting um, because specifically it prohibits injection that would endanger um, not just underground sources of drinking water that are currently used as such, um, but potential sources of drinking water as well. Um, so there's a limit in, in the statute itself that's, that defines what an underground source of drinking water is. And as long as the, the total dissolved solids in that aquifer are, be are below a certain amount, um, it, it meets the definition and you can't inject in such a way that would endanger it. Um, so it's actually, uh, you know, quite the powerful statute, um, but this one is where uh, expert advice is typically needed. So let's say you have um, a waste disposal well that's coming into your community. Um, this is happening, uh, as I mentioned, in Ohio quite often. Um, and uh, do you know, do you know the answers to these questions? Um, do you know where your underground sources of drinking water are? Um, if not, that would be a great thing to, to get a handle on. Um, and also, this is one where things get complicated in the sense that because things are taking place underground um, and, and it's, it's a very expert intensive area, it's definitely beneficial to have a geologist or hydrogeologist speak to the suitability of the, the proposed um, site uh, for that type of underground injection. Um, and if there are serious problems, this is, this is a place where you can really, uh, you might be able to, to stop one of these facilities. Um, briefly about air permits, the Clean Air Act, I would say, is our most complicated environmental law. So the permitting process gets, uh, gets pretty complicated quickly. Um, but mo both major sources and minor sources have permits. Um, so when we're thinking about oil and gas, for example, um, some compressor stations would have permits, gas processing facilities, ethane cracker plants, those would all be major sources. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, there would be, you know, both a permit required to even construct that facility and air permit required to even construct that facility, uh, as well as, as a, an operating permit. So here, it's the same type of uh, questions you need to be asking. Um, do you know where your closest ambient air quality monitor is? Do you know how reliable it is? Um, do you know, does it capture geography? So in the Ohio River Valley, we have uh, extremely variable geography. The wind patterns are very variable. Um, so you can see very different uh, air quality and very different meteorological patterns uh, just a few miles away. Um, 
so making sure that you are collecting um, air quality data is, is important um, or demanding that your agency do it. And so for this whole presentation, I want to be clear, um, we have to do things to protect ourselves. I think that that's true, uh, that, that that's the nature of, of the current regulatory framework. There just aren't enough resources or time or will um, to, to do all the monitoring that's required to make sure that our, our protected places remain protected and that we have the data to, to justify protecting them. Um, so I, I think that the reality is a lot of this does have to be done by communities and community groups and willing individuals. Um, but that's not to say that pressure shouldn't also be placed on the agencies to prioritize certain areas that matter to you and matter to your community. Um, and you can demand that, that they do some of this monitoring as well. Oh, and one other thing I wanted to mention about the major versus minor source. Um, with some of these facilities, uh, you'll see they might be on the cusp. When they initially applied for a permit, they might have been proposing what did constitute a minor source. Um, and then you'll see over time, um, they build up, they shift, uh, and, and really we're, we're now dealing with a major source. Um, when you are, are dealing with trying, trying to, to either enforce a permit or to, um, to appeal for a fight or appeal um, a permit that is in the process of being issued, uh, it's important to, to assess that question. Is, is this facility being properly categorized or is it actually a major source we're dealing with here? Um, so in the scenario, so let's, let's take the scenario where you have done an excellent job, uh, or, or a community group near you has done an excellent job at gathering data, um, on air quality for a major source coming in to emit in your community. Um, and so you know what your local air quality is, you're really concerned about, about what is coming in. Um, and you've commented on at every opportunity for comment. Um, if you've done all those things, uh, and then an, another thing to, and, and then the facility's going in anyway, let's say it's going in anyway. Um, one thing that when, when we look at how to have a stronger, um, a stronger permit uh, is this question of, what does the permit require in terms of monitoring? What reports must be kept? And who's going to hold the, those reports? Um, so you can sometimes see what's actually a fairly strong permit uh, in terms of the, the limits that are assigned. Um, but they are not, uh, while they have an extensive monitoring requirement, they're holding all reports on, on site, um, except for, you know, quarterly uh, violation reports, that's it. Um, well, if they're already recording, you know, continuous monitoring of certain pollutants, they're already doing all of that. None of that is public record, even if they're recording it, even if they're required to record it, unless it's in the agency's hands. Uh, so that's another important thing to, to look at when you're assessing whether a permit is strong, whether it's good enough, um, whether it is something that down the line, you as a citizen enforcer or an agency, uh, as an agency enforcer could, could actually uh, address. Um, so as I have already mentioned, um, there are numerous opportunities for, for public participation in, in a lot of these, these permits. Um, whether it's air, water, uh, underground injection control. Um, there typically is opportunity for written comment. Uh, public hearings are not always required. Um, it really varies on, on the permit uh, and the state requirements. Um, but if, if there's significant public interest, sometimes they can be requested, uh, which is a, another good thing to remember. Uh, you can contact your agencies um, and express that you're concerned about a project, no matter what. It doesn't matter if there's an open public comment or not. Uh, the open, open public comment matters 
for purposes of what the record will show. Uh, but these agencies, you can always call and express your concern and, and demonstrate that there's significant public interest in a, in a given project. Um, if it is a, a permit that would need a, an expert, um, and most of the time, most of the time they are, um, it's best to, to get that expert on early during the public comment period to help you effectively draft comments, make sure the most significant issues are brought up and to make sure that's in the record. But again, that should not stop you from bringing forth your personal concerns and your personal experience with the, the land, air, water uh, that, that a proposed facility will impact. Um, that site specific knowledge absolutely matters um, and, and should be gotten on the record. And I think that is all I have for, for right now, but I um, also, my computer is <laughs> just run out of battery, which is a bit of a surprise. So um, if Ryan wants to jump in and maybe field some questions, that would be great. Hey, just a sec. Okay. Um, thanks so much, Megan, for, for the presentation. Um, I'm back and oh, great. And yeah, we have a bunch of questions here. We've got 12 open questions. Um, I know that you all can upvote things. So if you see a question that someone else answered, uh, Josh pointed that out, thank you. Um, yeah, shall we, shall we jump into it? Sure. Oh really good, it looks like you found a charger. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just one. We'll give people a second to you know, think of questions and type them too. That's probably yeah. Do that. Yeah, definitely. Um, cool. So, let's see. Shall we uh, just? We can just start right at the top. Um, one of the questions from Judy is: How has the state of New York been so successful? with shutting out fracking? Can we follow their lead in Pennsylvania and Virginia and Texas and Ohio? <laughs> um. Yeah, well, so New York, I think, first of all, you're, you're dealing with a very different political climate. Um, the environmental impact statement that they did uh, assessing what the impacts were what was incredible um, and that took them a, a long way uh, in deciding to, to ban it um, but I do think it's important to remember that before then uh, I was you know living in New York uh, right right when those those battles were kind of gearing up um, and before then you did have individual communities who were making their own bands um, who were very politically active. Um, so I, I personally would say that, that, that it's more of a political battle than any legal strategy that they have taken, but certainly the extensive expert uh, work that they had demonstrating the, the concerns for New York uh, mattered. And in terms of how, how could we do that in, in Ohio and Pennsylvania, um, I, I mean, at least in the case of Pennsylvania, it does uh, seem that political will is, is shifting to some degree. Um, but I, I certainly think that, that the more the public can arm themselves with uh, data and express their, dis, their, the fact that they're not happy with how things are currently, uh, it has to keep going. Mm -hmm. Uh, Scott has a question add to the, well, oh, actually, is this an add on to a different question? Um, add that to the loophole question, the 1990s loophole for making oil and yeah. gas production waste non-hazardous. It's a, uh, he's referring to the, the Rick Casey question a few down, the, the shouldn't okay. closing the Halliburton loophole. Oh, great. Yeah. Let's, let's start there then. How does permitting of oil and gas drilling differ from state to state? How is it similar? In Colorado, this has been regulated by the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. So then adding on to that is, um, you know, the 1990s loophole for making oil and gas production waste, quote unquote, non-hazardous. Wait, yeah. actually, I think it's, it's adding on to the one below. I guess Rick Casey asked a lot of questions. Thanks, Rick. Um, the oh. question below that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. So See, this, this is why we co-pilot these things. <laughs> Can you see that? 
two, it's uh, shouldn't closing the Halliburton loophole in the 2005 Energy Policy Act at the federal level be a leading goal in the fight against fracking? I think that that's absolutely true. Um, and uh, I, our Fair Shakes Executive Director gave, I thought, excellent testimony um, recently before the House of Representatives, uh, a subcommittee, um, arguing exactly that. Uh, so just to clarify a little bit, um, when I talked about underground injection control permits, uh, and I mentioned any any underground injection uh, needs to go through a, a rigorous review um, by eliminating oil and gas from from that requirement, which is what they did. Uh, you don't have you don't have a federal requirement to do the same rigorous review that would otherwise apply to an underground injection of that nature. Uh, if you did have that type of rigorous review. Uh, I think you would see many of the problems we've seen be, they would be prevented. Um, so yes, I would say that that absolutely should be a priority, uh, as is the states are still able, the states can set their own requirements. They are not prohibited from doing so. They could, they just don't by and large. Um, and so what we, we see is, is weak regulation uh, at the state level that would no longer be permitted should there be a federal floor prohibiting it. All right, and should we go on to the next question then? Sure. So Matt is asking, for air permits, have you seen successes in regulating for acute exposures rather than averages? The latter fails to deal with the real risks to people, but seems common. So, th so this is interesting, and again, it would really uh, depend on the the specific permit. Um, most of the permits that I I have seen, yes, so that you are going to have um, short term. Uh, exposure limits in there as well. Um, it's not only going to be, uh, you know, a rolling uh, annual average um, that you will have hourly limits, for example. Um, so, so yes, you, you do see those in permits. Um, but whether they are sufficient to protect um, for human health, um, they're designed to make sure that ambient air quality standards are met. Um, that's the purpose of, of those limits in, in permits. Um, so where things get tricky is one, uh, have you accurately assessed uh, the air quality in a given area? So is, is the agency appropriately considering how this new addition will impact the levels of pollution that are already there. Um, and that is often done through modeling. And so that is why it's extremely important to have uh, good background data, as well as why um, we need good data on, on exactly what, what um, the questioner states. Uh, what are the, the, the benchmarks there for, for acute exposure and, and does the permit address them? Um, and I would expect sometimes you see it and, and sometimes you don't. Um, I know one of the questions that, that came in that might be relevant to that is how to find the right experts to enlist from Sherry, um, just in terms of like getting the data, getting, getting people who can help compile things. Yeah, and there's definitely um, varying qu qualities of data uh, too. So any any data you have is evidence, and it and it's good. So um, you know it's it's good to to do that community science and you know, work with a local university or even a high school. That type of um, work matters in terms of just collecting. It's some it's some evidence. It's better than nothing. Um, if you can be working with a scientist who can you know keep the correct the proper chain of custody, go to Ohio, uh, go to a certified lab, a state certified lab, do all of that. That obviously is preferable. Um, but you, I don't, we shouldn't let that goal uh, prevent us from, 
from doing other things that are within reach. In terms of finding the best experts, um, we're happy to talk to people about uh, people that we could recommend. Um, but likewise, I think if you reach out to your, your local universities um, and some of, some of the nonprofits around who already have partnered with experts on different permit, permits and permit appeals um, probably have recommendations for depending on, you know, if it's air or water or geology, um, who, who they would go with and who they would recommend. So not yeah. the, the best answer, but I think that's the, the most realistic. Well, I can also say that like uh, Health the Harm Network has a directory with a few hundred people that have made themselves available to be either like organizers or experts or even just other folks that are like you that are like dealing with these questions. So that also wonderful. could be a resource for you. We have a, um, a database of people that have made themselves available. So again, like I kind of act like a switchboard for that type of stuff. So feel free to reach out to me for any of that sort of halt the harm directory information, if that seems valuable to you. Um, there, was a, there was a question too about, can these questions be summarized and emailed out to participants? And totally. So um, I'm doing my best here to like kind of bookmark the, the Q&A. So you will get a follow-up email with a replay and then, um, some of these, this Q&A as well. Yeah, and, and we'll send out the slide deck too. So um, oh, great. Yeah, there's some things that people skipped over, you know, some uh, slides that people saw that were skipped over. I know there's a question about that. We'll, we'll make sure that the whole uh, deck is sent out so you can look over those. And I also would say that um, some of those were, were just found on the internet and most of them, actually all of them were not created specifically by us, but we found them interesting. And so it's good to know that there are, there are tools out there on the web to help you understand the, each process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can compile links, um, links to sources and stuff like that. Um, so let's go back to Rick Casey's question. How does permitting of oil and gas drilling differ from state to state? And how is it similar? So in Colorado, this has been regulated by the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. Yeah, so quite honestly, I, I don't have the, the knowledge to give a, a huge overview of the, of the state by state differences. Um, here in Ohio, it's split. It's actually split uh, between Ohio EPA um, is going to deal only with if it's impacting air, water. Um, so it has this kind of secondary uh, impact, but primarily it is regulated by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. Um, and that creates a lot of problems for people who are trying to get their questions answered because the two agencies can, can kick them back and forth. Um, and, and also in, in the permitting process itself, the Ohio EPA will play certain parts in, in the permitting process. Um, and also in the case of Ohio, for any radioactive material that is, is leaving um, these oil and gas production, uh, it should be rec regulated by the Ohio Department of Health and to a degree is, uh, they certainly have authority to regulate it. Um, and, and so that creates yet another uh, triangulation in um, how it is practically regulated. Uh, Pennsylvania, I think you, you see DEP doing most of it, um, but I don't, I don't wanna, uh, I can't go through, through every state. Uh, so it really depends on a state by state basis. Um, it's similar in that, uh, you know, we mentioned the Halliburton loophole earlier, uh, but the Clean Air Act still applies. Uh, the Clean Water Act still applies. Uh, there are just going to be some, some limitations. Uh, and so how each state already uh, um, implements the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, it varies from state to state. So you have certain federal floors and then the state's in charge of its own implementation. Um, and, and so you have a lot of differences, state to state and environmental regulation period with that federal floor though, except for, for the Safe Drinking Water Act and, and oil and gas. Awesome. Rosemary is asking, here in Massachusetts, state environmental reviews seem to have both construction impacts and operational impacts under the same review process. Does having separate construction and operational permits lend extra opportunities to stop a project? Um, 
I would say no. Uh, it gives opportunities for additional involvement, perhaps for tightening um, of certain provisions. Uh, but in terms of, of actually stopping it, uh, no, I, I wouldn't think it would uh, provide extra opportunity to do that. OK. Uh, Bev says, this is not related to legal things, only answer at the end if time allows, but what would it take to create a nationwide fracking ban? Um, I, I, quite honestly, I don't know what the, the answer to that question would be um, other than political will, which it seems like we have a long way to go. Hmm. Like if there's a will, there's a way. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I think you, you would you would need legislation, um, and and that's a, ma a matter of politics as opposed to to law, as as the questioner mm -hmm. states. Um, but I, I mean, it, it does seem like globally there is growing concern about the industry. Um, I personally think that for a long time there was a misunderstanding about what fracking was. I think people use that word and. Um, industry was able to say this is just a process we've done for a long time um, and really what we're talking about is is the industrialization of enormous uh, pieces of uh, stretches of land uh, that, that before were rural um, and, and an enormous web of impacts uh, that, that aren't it's not enough to just say fracking when we're talking about water withdrawals, waste disposal. Uh, it, it is so much more than, than that one word uh, encompasses. And, and I think that a lot more could be done to, uh, I mean, I don't know, activists are already doing so much, but I think there's room for the public to better understand the breadth of impacts um, mm -hmm. from, from the, that, the industry. Mm -hmm. um, Sherry is wondering, does one always need a lawyer to appeal a permit decision? Can an individual pursue this? So it would depend on your state's processes. Um, so here in Ohio, uh, as a layperson, you could absolutely file um, a, a notice of appeal uh, and represent yourself. Um, it, so again, it would just vary um, state by state. Okay. Um, there's a question about from Cheryl, what is the most effective way to slow down the permitting process for a specific well? In your experience, is targeting land use, zoning laws, air quality, or water quality the only way to slow things down? So, okay. Um, so the questioner is asking about slowing down the permitting process. The permitting process for a production well? Mm hmm. Again, it would depend on, on the states. Uh, in Ohio, it is extremely challenging. Uh, you, you can't appeal a, a, per, a well permit, a permit to drill in Ohio. Um, so that, that makes things really challenging. Um, so I, I don't have advice for the most effective way to slow down production generally. Um, it, sound, it seems like in Pennsylvania, they have been able to have some success with, with using land use and zoning laws. Um, in, in my experience in Ohio, uh, I have not seen an effective uh, means of slowing the permitting process down for production wells, to be clear. If we're talking about injection wells, uh, waste disposal wells, uh, there I would say get an expert, understand the geology uh, and, and have a strong, hopefully have a strong basis to, to challenge. Um, but typically there, there are some, some things that you could challenge uh, with the disposal wells. Great. So um, we have a question about some baseline um, baseline uh, questions as well. So what are the specific air quality measurements that should be taken pre-drilling and serially afterwards, like sulfur dioxide, for example? Yeah. Yeah, sulfur dioxide is definitely one. VOCs, uh, mo regular VOC monitoring is important. Um, hydrogen sulfide, if that's relevant to, to your area, some areas that's more of a problem than others. Um, Nitrous oxides can also be an issue. Um, 
and particulate matter, depending on what the piece of infrastructure is. If you're only talking production wells, it might be less of an issue, but still with the flares, you can have, have some problems. Is it the kind of thing where you can, when we're talking about gathering baseline data, is it about requiring the company to gather it? Or is this something that like everyday folks or, or there's another question about how do you recommend watershed groups becoming involved? You know, where so is their funding? Watershed, for- yeah, if watershed groups did, um, like some already have wonderful water monitoring programs. I think that could be really great for them to provide baseline um, monitoring services. Um, yes, mm-hmm. you could have a, a company be required to do, you know, pre-drills or to, to monitor things afterwards. Um, in general, I think it's better if it's the citizens doing it or the state agency doing it. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, it's always good to to have more data than less. So the more the more you know the numbers before something's built, the better. Um, so as as best of the information as you can get is the answer to that question for as long as you can possibly get it. Hmm. Um. So am I going to be able to? I'm happy to respond to the this question about it's a very specific question about the social and economic justification. Yeah. I, I would want to just follow up with, with the question or with the citation. Um, will I be able to do that? Can I get her contact information or something? Yeah, yeah, definitely. The, the question is where can I find the regulations which determine the adequacy of a social and economic justification? Legal cases which are defined, what, which define what is required. We're dealing with a permit for stormwater outfall to an HQ stream, but we don't believe that their social economic justification provides is sufficient. I can't find a reference. So, and I, I'm happy to just follow up, uh, as I mentioned, um, Great. email and provide um, some, some sites. Perfect. So we're just about at time and just wanted to let everybody know that um, you know, thank you for coming. Uh, we can still, if, uh, Megan, do you want to stay on and answer a couple more questions or do you want to be following up via email? Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer a couple more of these. That, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. So sure. just because we're, we're at the end and, and some people might leave, I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew about the Fracking Help Center. This is a project that Fair Shake has been um, starting to get involved with. It's also Mountain Watershed Association has contributed a ton of information to the Fracking Help Center as well. Um, what it is, is it's a resource center online that you can use to ask questions about zoning and permits. You you're, will notice that a lot of the data here might be Pennsylvania specific, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't ask a question to the help center because what happens is that those questions create support tickets that um, folks from Fair Shake and uh, myself with Health to Harm, also somebody from Frack Tracker is, is in there answering questions. But we can not only point your questions toward experts who can give a response, but we can also use those questions to prompt us to create new articles for the Help Center. So this has a lot of potential because it's a knowledge base that we can all share as a movement, as people that are affected by oil and gas industry. So just go to frackingnextdoor.com and you can check out the, you get the links to the, to both the hotline where you can call in, but also the online platform where you can ask a question. So that's my little (laughs) public service announcement at the end of the webinar before we um, continue asking some questions. So if this was your first time on a webinar with Health to Harm, you know, I just want to thank you so much for coming and Stay tuned for the next webinars and make sure to check out everything that um, Megan and Josh are doing with Fair Shake. You know, there's more people involved too. They're doing really amazing work. And I'll be sending you some more info as well as the replay and a survey at the end of the webinar. Um, and uh, yeah, we can we can jump back jump back to the questions a little bit, but just wanted to give those give that closing information for everybody. Um, and Josh, I know you might have to might have to hop off as well, but we'll keep going with a couple more questions. Um, 
So a question from Alisa. We're finding even with strong ordinances, like with our strong seismic testing ordinances in Monroeville, Pennsylvania, the companies are not following the ordinances. They get permits without problem and then do not even follow strong ordinances. What's the deal with that? Well, it sounds like someone needs to be enforcing the ordinance. <laughs> uh, and I, I do not know uh, how to get someone to do that um, from just from the Ohio perspective. We, we don't have a lot of success with zoning over here. Um, but, but yes, they, I mean, someone needs to be enforcing the, the ordinances. Uh, so holding their feet to the fire there would, would help. Um, sorry to not be more helpful. Josh, you've been doing some uh, ordinance work recently. Do you, have you dealt with anyone enforcing this? Well, I, I guess I've never really heard of uh, it, the ordinance not being enforced. It sounds like it's a, that would be a council, like you said, like it would be on the council to enforce those. But maybe she's, at least is talking about like the fact that by the time it gets to the zoning process, usually the permits are already in place. Uh, like the EPA permits, most of the permits we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe she was tr getting at that it feels like it forces councils to just, you know, do their part and sign on the dotted line as well. Um, and maybe they overlook like what is actually required in the ordinance to do that. I, I don't know. Um, it sounds like this is another one of those specific questions that um, that maybe, you know, it, if, if we reach out, we could probably get to the bottom of that answer. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I wish I had yeah. a, one of our PA attorneys with us right now. Maybe we can bring some of these questions that we're not able to um, answer right here, like into the help center, actually, and yeah, and respond that way. Great. Um, cool. Thanks, Eliza, for um, or Lisa for bringing that up. Um, are permits required for transport of hazardous truck waste on the Pennsylvania Turnpike and on other roads? Will local municipalities hold these records? Where do we look for these permits? Okay, so there again, it depends on wh what you're meaning by hazardous waste and what is defined as hazardous waste. Um, so as someone already mentioned, uh, a lot of oil and gas waste is, is not going to be defined as hazardous waste. Um, so we think of RICRA as being the primary law that governs hazardous waste. Um, and that has a cradle to grave model where uh, everything should be tracked um, from when it's created and it, it, till its final resting place. Um, so if you're talking about hazardous waste that is classified as such, uh, then those records should be present with the waste as it's traveling. So they should be on with the hauler. Um, so you should be able to get access to, to those reports. Um, but if you're talking about, for example, what's called residual waste, uh, which very well might be radioactive uh, and is just an amalgamation of a bunch of oil and gas waste, um, most likely no, that, that is not, uh, it, I mean, it depends on the state. So for example, Ohio, um, if they're hauling brine, then yes, they have to register, they have to keep a record. Um, in Pennsylvania, uh, I believe they do also have to register. Um, in terms of which agency holds that in Pennsylvania, I do not know the answer. We could get back to you though. Great. Rosemary asks, um, well, actually, sorry, that's more of a statement. Rosemary just said, at least for transmission pipelines, state environmental permits are starting to become the straw that breaks the pipelines back and cancels them. Um, New York's yeah. DEC has been phenomenal. Yeah, New York's DEC has done a great job. Other states are not as lucky. Um, and so just sorting through a couple of questions here. Um, Jeanne is asking, isn't the burden of proof to show the injection of toxic waste into an area is on the applicant via the EPA UIC application? And if this isn't provided, we can force our local officials to insist applicants comply with federal EPA permitting. And forcing our local officials to do their job is through a writ of mandate. So, um, 
so typically, see how this would pan out. Um, yes, so so the burden is on the applicant to show that they meet the UIC requirements during the, the USIC application. Um, so yes, if the agency in charge of that permitting, um, so in Pennsylvania, it would be, uh, I think USCPA still has control. Um, in Ohio, it's ODNR. Um, that agency, uh, if they are not ensuring that all the requirements are met, um, then that's where you would appeal the permit alleging that uh, the agency did not do its job during the review and issued an unlawful permit. Um, so in the context of, of a permit appeal, uh, that, that's how it, it would happen. Um, yes, there are, if, if you're talking about uh, injection well that's already in, um, it, there would also be enforcement opportunities that a citizen could could do um but but there again you can't the one thing you can't sue a regulator for basically is is not enforcing um that that's the one thing you can't sue them for uh there are other aspects of their job that are not discretionary that you can sue them for not doing uh but for just not enforcing uh they have a lot of discretion um but uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act does have a citizen suit provision. Uh, so you could take, if we're talking about an existing injection well, um, you could go against the polluter. You could file a citizen suit under the Safe Drinking Water Act against the polluter. Again, all of this depends on the facts at issue, what avenues uh, would be possible. Awesome. Hey, Josh. Did you see, uh, was there still a question that was missed before that I need to get to? Um, so, yeah, I'm trying to find it. It was one about Louisiana. Um, uh, um, yeah, so it was from Scott. It was about, uh, are, so the question is, are there technology grants available to create notification systems for permits from regulators' websites or federal register uh, registers, um, and so it goes on and talks a little bit about like something that they've created, and I, I just wanted I, I was interested in the question and accidentally clicked uh, a button and then got sent over to the answered section. But I just wanted to say to, to Scott that um, while I don't know the answer to that, it's a really good question and something that I have thought of myself. It's it's clear that there's a lot of Part of this problem uh, of public participation is a, um, a spreading out of the information and, and making it confusing to to get to it, or just the, it is confusing to find all of it. So um, I, I think that that tool is absolutely needed, and I'm glad that you're recognizing that. And and it sure seems like there should be some sort of technology grants out there for for that kind of uh, project and. If I do find anything, I will, be, I will send it your way and vice versa um, and keep us posted on how that website's going because that is a very useful tool. I'm glad someone's taking on that challenge. Awesome. Yeah, and, and uh, Scott posted a link in the chat as well. Yeah, I saw that. Thanks, Scott. Invite you to look up your area on our Much project. Much love back to you. Wetland data. Cool, that's awesome. Um, it also shared an Earthworks link about uh, the Halliburton loophole. Yeah. So um, it's, it's cool. We're compiling some links that we can send out over the the replay webinar. Yeah. Um, cool. Just a couple couple more quick ones here. Um, uh, what percentage of permit appeals settle? And is there a concern that unsuccessful permit appeals could create harmful legal precedent? Yeah, so there could be that concern, absolutely, always. Uh, that That is a, a relevant concern. I don't know the percentage that settle. I would bet most of them. Um, that's just any litigation, most, most cases settle. Um, and that's something I didn't speak about, uh, but that is something that when, when you think about settlement, uh, one of the results of settlements that you frequently see in the permit appeal context is a stronger permit. Uh, so, so having you know better reporting, having better control technology, tighter limits. There are all, all kinds of things that you might see uh, that could improve a permit as a result of, of a settlement of a permit appeal. Mm -hmm. Great. 
So the last the last comment here that we didn't get to too much is about the rights of nature. Um, <laughs> Eliza said, "Yes, let's talk the rights of nature." Do you want to add any comments about that? I mean, I think it's an interesting uh, phenomenon that's happening right now. And again, you know, we've seen it happening uh, globally with, with some success. And then I saw an earlier comment was on Lake Erie um, and the Lake Erie Bill of Rights here in Toledo that Toledo voters overwhelmingly supported. Um, but then what you saw happen was our state house has then passed legislation to prohibit it. So, um, it is something that, I mean, I think it's interesting. I, I think that legally it's a, it's a new way of, of looking at things that it will take us time to get caught up on that. Um, but international law tells us a lot about frameworks we could use. Cool. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Megan, for coming on and sharing your presentation and then taking all this time to answer questions and even going over a little bit. We really appreciate it. Sure. And it was you know, wonderful to, to have eager listeners and, um, and I'm happy to be here again. So thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, totally. So again, for everybody here, we'll make sure that you get the replay link, the slide deck that uh, Megan put together, uh, links, references. We'll do our best. It sounds like we've got some work to do this afternoon to kind of pull that all together and send it to you. So um, thanks for tuning in and, and stay in touch. All right. Bye, everyone. See you bye. later, everybody. See ya, bye.